Now we're going to think about the philosophy of time. And what we're going to do is we're going to explore it by starting off to think about two questions. The first question is, what kind of temporal structure do we think there is in the world? And the second question is, how many times do we think exist? Okay, and using those two questions, we're gonna drive a whole bunch of different positions. Let's start off by thinking about temporal structure and following a very, very famous early 20th century paper by John Ellis McTaggart, we're going to divide up the ways of thinking about temporal structure into two camps. The first is known as an a-theoretic way of thinking about temporal structure. And what the a-theorists think is that the fundamental structure of reality, or the fundamental temporal structure of reality, is given to us by there being properties of future, present and past, and by entities in time gaining and losing those properties. So if you imagine the start of the 20th century, there was a time when that had the property being future, then it acquired the property of being present, and now it has the property of being past. Well and good. That's an a-theoretic way of thinking about reality. In contrast, there's also a b-theoretic way of thinking about reality. And what b-theorists will say is that the fundamental temporal structure of reality consists not in this fluxy, flowing, moving kind of notion of temporal structure, but in what are sometimes called fixed and permanent b-relations, or relations of earlier than and later than. Uh, and this is fixed and permanent in the following sense. Go back to that start of the 20th century. That has always been earlier than the time of my recording this video. It's always been later than the Battle of Hastings, which took place in 1066. And so the fundamental structure of reality just consists in those earlier than and later than relations that connect up various events in time. So we've got this a-theoretic picture, there are these properties of future, present and past, and these are in some sense or other moving and, and dynamic. And on the other hand, we have these B-theoretic views where there are these earlier than and later than relations that are fixed and permanent. So that's the temporal structure question. Now we come on to the, but how many times are there question. And the first view that's gonna cross our radar in this video is called presentism. And presentism is an A-theoretic view because it says there is a property of presentness and it attaches to a time, but that's the only time that exists. So everything that exists is present. So I exist right now, but dinosaurs don't. Future Mars outposts in 3024 don't exist. They're no part of reality. Of course, as events change, those future states will gain the property of presence. They will come into existence. Uh, and when they do that, they then will be present. So the presentist doesn't think the world is in some sense stuck or static, but they do think that only one time exists, the present time and there's a constant change with respect to which things are present. So this is an a-theoretic view uh, in that it has a property of presentness, but only one time exists. Now, if we expand a little bit to include not just present things, but also past things, then we get to the next view that philosophers are sometimes interested in. And this is the view known as the growing block view. So-called because reality is a block that grows. Uh, so we have all of the present things and the past things, and the passage of time simply consists in the addition of existing things to that block. Okay? But unlike the presentist, the growing block theorist thinks there really are dinosaurs. They, they exist in a very real sense. They, they are out there in the past as existing things. So that's another atheoretic view, because there is this property of presentness, there is a property of pastness, and uh, some more times exist. We haven't just got the present ones, we've also got the past ones. Okay, the next view, and I'm sure you can guess where this is going, is going to have not only the present times, but the past times, and also the future times. Uh, and on this view, there is a property of presentness, much like a spotlight on a timeline, and it's moving slowly along the timeline from earlier through to later. At one point, it was the case that dinosaurs were present, now I'm present, uh, various states in the future, Mars outpost in 3024 will be present. And presence is just this property that moves its way along uh, these, all of these existing things. And past, present and future times all exist. So all of those views are versions of the A theory. 
And we can contrast those with B-theoretic views. And B-theoretic views tend to say all times are equally real. So this isn't a presentist view, this isn't a growing block view. It's much closer to the moving spotlight view. But it doesn't think that there are any A properties. There's no property of presence that's moving over the timeline. There's no robust notion of temporal passage on such a picture. There are just these fixed and permanent earlier than and later than relations that connect events in time. And all times are equally real. Now, that gives us a whole collection of different views. What sorts of consideration might we bring to bear in trying to choose between them? Well, atheists will typically reach for a couple of different sorts of arguments, many of them turning on our experience of time. So I said that the B-theorist looks like they're denying that rich, robust notion of temporal passage because all there are are these fixed and permanent earlier than, later than relations. The atheist seems to have a more dynamic universe where there's a property of presence moving or there's this constant addition of entities to the block or there's only present things exist and there's a constant change with respect to which ones those are. And if you're inclined to think that our experience of time really is an experience that's in some sense atheoretic, it feels dynamic, then you're more likely to be drawn to an atheoretic kind of view. Atheists also sometimes draw on a particular feature of our experiences known as the asymmetry of our experiences to try and motivate their position. And it's relatively straightforward to, to sort of explain what goes on in such cases. Um, think about a case of relief that some past event has occurred. So perhaps a particularly nasty trip to the dentist with a particularly painful extraction. That past thing no longer seems to matter to us. It seems to be out there in the past, but in some sense, but it doesn't really seem to matter to us in the way that it would if it were future, and certainly not like if it were present. Right? If I was in massive amounts of pain right now, you'd know about it, I'd know about it, it would be dreadful, uh, all things would be horrible for me. But it's gone. It's no longer a part of reality, says the presence at any rate, and that's how we can explain uh, and make sense of our attitudes towards it. But what we certainly can't do, says the atheist, is make sense of that on a B-theoretic picture. And why not? Well, because there is no flow. Rather, what we have is simply that past event out there existing, existing in a fixed and permanent relation of being earlier than to me now, um, where I am in pain. And if that exists, then it should matter to me now just as much as it did then, says the atheist. Of course, B-theorists have a whole variety of different responses to that, but that at least gives you a flavour of the sorts of ways in which an atheorist might try and motivate their view. In contrast, it looks like the B-theorist has uh, a very different sort of argument to bring to bear here. What all of the atheoristic views had in common was they had uh, this notion of things being absolutely present. The presentist said only present things exist. The growing block theorist says that there are these present things, all of which exist, um, and the moving spotlighter says that there's a moving spotlight of presence that moves along the timeline. Now, it would seem very intuitive to say that any things that are present are simultaneous with one another. And the worry from the B-theorist, or the argument that the B-theorist is able to bring to bear here, concerns the special theory of relativity, as well as other various bits uh, of our scientific practice, which look to have no place in them for any kind of structure of absolute simultaneity. So the thought is, if you look to our best science, you look to the special theory of relativity, you don't find absolute simultaneity. Indeed, it looks like, being a consequence of accepting our best science, that there is no such notion as absolute simultaneity. And if there's no such notion as absolute simultaneity, well, then it doesn't look like there's this universal present that the A-theorist was describing as existing. And, says the B-theorist, if that's what the special theory of relativity tells us, then really what it's telling us is that all of these A-theoretic views are false. Now, again, there are all sorts of arguments that atheists have in response, but again, that gives you a flavour of the sorts of moves that we might be inclined to make if we're B-theorists attacking the A-theory. But there is just one last consideration that we might like to think about just briefly, and this also takes its cue from some of our best science. 
There are various different interpretations of quantum field theory in which it looks like all temporal structure drops out completely. So on these models, there's no metric, there's no con temporal connection that looks like it's connecting up points uh, in reality. And so we might worry that actually it's not just the case that our best physics is telling us to not be a theorists. We might think that our best physics is actually telling us that there's no such thing as time at all, and that time is in fact unreal. Now, if that's the case, then we've got a whole host of other issues that we're gonna to have to deal with, because it certainly does seem to us as if time is real. Uh, it seems to me that the clocks, clock hands are going round the face and so on, but if there's really no temporal structure in the world, we're gonna to have to make sense of that notion. We're also going to have to do some interesting recovery work because the way in which science is normally taken to be practiced and to generate confirmation is via testing, a hypothesis formation and testing and so on. And of course, if there's no temporal structure in the world, then we can't engage in that kind of practice because testing and hypothesis formation take time. And so if time is unreal, that looks like it's going to be a bit of a challenge to try and recover. So there we have it, three different kinds of position that we might take in the philosophy of time. We could be A theoretic and hold a whole host of different sorts of views. We could be B theorists, or we could take the plunge uh, and we could try and deny the reality of time altogether.